Hello everyone, I'm Bartolo for Gallery Teachers and we are producing a series of videos about TEFL, that is teaching English as a foreign language. Today we are going to talk about the different meanings of uh, the various acronyms around the teaching English word, like TEFL, TESOL, ESL, EFL, what do they mean? Basically exactly the same thing, but they are completely different. Our very special guest for today is Amy Gauss. She is uh, an English teacher, a blogger, a writer, Yay. and uh, many other very interesting things. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Amy Gauss. Hi, everybody. Hello. Thank you for that lovely introduction. That's all. Amy, I'm uh, really excited. You are one of our collaborators. You wrote one very interesting article uh, mm -hmm. for our blog, and uh, actually, we are going to talk about that um, today. So the first time that you contacted me, it was very strange for me because uh, I covered many different aspects of uh, teaching English as a foreign language. And then you suggested an article about explaining the acronyms that we use. And I thought, this is interesting. This is a topic that we never covered. How did you come up with uh, this idea? Well, I think most, not most, um, a lot of teachers, myself included, especially when we first started, kind of thought they were all just pretty interchangeable. You can use either one and it doesn't really matter. And I was of that opinion as well, um, until I stepped out of EFL and went more towards ESOL, which is English speaking for other languages. As I came to learn, it's actually quite different. The motivation behind the learning is different. The way it's taught is different. And just how it's taught and why it's taught are completely different. And it wasn't until... I made the switch that I was, I was made aware of that. So I thought, if I think this, then I imagine tons of other teachers do as well. So why not put my experience down on paper? Usually we talk about TEFL, that is mm -hmm. uh, teaching English as a foreign language. Uh, you mentioned TESOL. So mm -hmm. what's the difference between TEFL and TESOL? So it's, it's the focus. So if you're Italian and you're living in Italy and you're studying English after school, after work or on the weekend, then you're doing TEFL or EFL. You're studying English pretty much as, as a hobby or a way to help when you're traveling or maybe to do with work. But with ESOL, you are living in the UK and your intention is to stay in the UK. So you need English for work, job applications, to go to the doctors, to sign your children up to the local schools, even things like reading the bus timetables or signing up for council tax, those errands and jobs that people just do usually, you, they're, they're made much more difficult when you have to do them in another language. So the focus is shifted when it's ESOL and it's your, your place. Why are you learning it? If you're in the UK for six weeks and then you're going to go back or if you're going to university, then that is not ESOL. That again is EFL um, because you're doing it not for your life, for your education or work. If you need it to survive, then it's ESOL. We tend to consider English as the main culture. While actually when we are teaching English, we have to focus on our students and maybe they have a different approach to the language. Uh, am I correct in saying that? Yeah, I think that that focus on culture is important when you look at ESOL because the students are living in the UK, they're working here, they're mixing with people from the UK or even smaller than that, from your local towns. Like my local town, Oldham, I need to teach my ESOL students how to survive in Oldham. I don't need to teach them the accent or how to pronounce things for London because they're in Oldham. So they need to be able to understand people and interact with people from Oldham. And that involves our culture. Even things as simple as in the North, we say breakfast, dinner, and tea. We don't have lunch. We have dinner in the afternoon and tea in the evening. So I need to teach my students that because that's what they'll hear. When their kids go to school, it's not lunchtime, it's dinner time. So those small cultural differences, even within a culture itself, need to be taught. Whereas if it's just a hobby, then the culture is interesting to learn and it could be you know, covered under one topic or close to a celebration. But when it's ESOL, it's integral to, to why they're doing it, basically. There are some times where our students don't really want to 
it's not really their choice to learn English. For mm -hmm. example, I remember when I was working in a school in London, I worked with uh, refugees. By the way, we have a, a very interesting program for sponsoring if uh, our students agree on giving a certain amount of hours to help refugees uh, to teach okay. English. And a lot of people escape from war. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are not really interested in uh, uh, speaking the best English in the world, but they understand that they have to start a new life. How do you approach this kind of uh, students? Um, a lot of my students at the moment, are, as I said, ESO students, so they're from, I have a few from Libya, a couple from Syria, um, a few from like Pakistan, Bangladesh. So they are, they're at the immigrants, some of them may be asylum seekers. And one of the problems is that I, you know, I couldn't say from London because I don't work down there, but especially in Oldham, there are closed communities. So there will be certain areas where all the Bangladeshi families will live or a certain area where all the Eastern European families will live and the shops will have people who speak those languages. So there's not always an immediate need to speak the English because they can get by speaking Arabic or speaking Polish or whatever it is. But it's when they step outside of that bubble when they start to go into the workplace or if they need to go to college to get a visa, then you have to make them realize that even though it's great to speak your own language in your mini community, you're not in your mini community forever. And if you're going to stay here, then unfortunately, you need to know how to get by. This brings up another issue that is isolation. As teachers, we might be the only external contact that these people have. What's our role as teachers? Are we just focusing on teaching English or we should focus also on helping these people and understanding if they have any problems? Well, I think it depends on your stance on safeguarding. So a lot of people, when you think of safeguarding, you think of kids. Safeguarding and adults are people who have special needs or maybe some learning issues that they need extra attention on extra attention with sorry but we've also got to think of safeguarding as you're the teacher and they're the student so there is automatically that power imbalance you're the one with the information you're the one with the knowledge and as you said a lot of the times when students live in these bubbles these closed communities the only people outside of that they speak to is me or you or the teacher so they need you need to be open to them asking you questions and asking advice because there's nobody else to ask. So even if as a teacher, you don't feel like you can give advice in that situation, you need to be prepared to send them in the right direction. Especially when you think of things like um, equal opportunities, British values, because I work in a college, British values is pushed, which means like, sexual harassment, discrimination, um, not being prejudiced against other people. These are, these are what we teach because this is the ethos of the country. And it's through this that students sometimes might realize, oh, well, that's not how it's done in my household or that's not how it's done in my country. And they, they want to learn more about this. They're only going to ask you because you're the only one they can ask. So I think you definitely need to be open about it just in case they do ask. How do we approach somebody that uh, comes from a different culture and maybe is not really interested in uh, taking your classes? I understand that there are, um, there's a different structure in uh, who pays for the classes. So sometimes in, uh, in TEFL is the student that pays and uh, in other programs it's the state that pays or mm -hmm. it's an institution or a charity. And maybe uh, in that case they are not really interested in uh, learning English. It's just something that they have to do. So how do you grab their interest in uh, that particular case? So it's about finding why they're learning. You need to figure out really early on what is the reason why these people are learning. Is it because they want to go to uni? Is it because of their visa? Or is it simply because their parents say they have to? Then you need to use that. At the end of the day, most of these students are adults. So you can't force them. You just need to have the rapport, have that relationship to be able to have like a frank chat they look you at the end of the day you're wasting your money if you don't come you might as well tear your 10 pound and throw it out the door i think for me that works if i remind them of the money that's gone into it if it's them or their parents they're more inclined to pay attention because they want value for money if they haven't paid for it and it's funded 
say by the local authority or the college or a charity, then they need that to pass a test to get their visa. So there's always something that you can use to get them engaged again. But it is common that they'll just drift off halfway through the course and you have to re-engage them by bombarding them with emails and phone calls and whatever you need to get them back in, in the lessons, basically. Okay, so you, you bombard them with uh, phone calls. This is an aspect of the job that I've never considered. So my next question was, how do you keep your students? So you, the answer is bombarding them with uh, phone calls, spamming them. <laughs> yes, basically, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's about staying in contact. And sometimes you need to find out why. So why aren't they attending? Are they attending because they've been ill? Um, but maybe they don't have the language in order to contact the doctor with the safeguarding in mind that's my responsibility or you know my school's responsibility to find out how they are and how we can help them this year with covid you know a lot of students are struggling with mental health issues loneliness if they've not been in class for say two or three weeks they could very potentially not have had any contact with anybody in that stretch of time so we need to keep that door open and find out why they aren't attending Usually people don't attend just because they can't be bothered. Maybe once or twice, but you don't miss a month of classes because they can't be bothered. There's usually a reason why, and you just need to find out what that reason is and help them if you can. If we are interested in uh, learning with you, how mm -hmm. do we find you? The easiest way is on social media, so Instagram and Facebook. And my name is the same on both of them. It's English Language with Amy. Um, my face is the profile name, the profile picture, so I'm pretty easy to find. And my email address is also englishlanguagewithamy at gmail.com. I like to keep it consistent. I just think it makes it a bit easier for everybody involved. Okay, and uh, Amy also uh, works with uh, Gallery Teachers, so if you want to get in touch with uh, Amy, write to us at editorial at galleryteachers.com and we will put you in touch uh, with, uh, with her. We are also starting uh, a new program about teaching English online mm -hmm. and uh, Amy will be uh, one of our experts to yep. uh, give lessons online, so uh, keep in touch. Thank you, Amy. It's been really nice to talk to you. A great interview. I really don't know how I will edit it, but a lot of strong material and uh, hopefully maybe we'll have another interview if you want. So yeah, <laughs> yeah and, definitely. Uh, I'd like to the project that you mentioned um, about like the online co courses and things. And I was looking that you do the like asynchronous training for teachers. Well, it's definitely something that I want to get involved in. So um, yeah, keep me in mind. Let me know when things are going on. That's all for today. I'm Bartolo for Gallery Teachers, and uh, today we had Amy Gauss. If it's uh, the first time you are here on YouTube, please uh, subscribe to our channel. And uh, until ne the next time, happy teaching and happy learning.